Urban Ministry, where faith and activism meet. Here's your host, Brother Leon Prophet to the streets and pastor to the people. What's going on? It's the Lord family. What is going on this morning? It's snowing outside. It's Valentine's Day weekend as well as Super Bowl weekend. So I'm going to tell you like I told you before, yo, there is heat in the shovel. So hey, we're going to go in here. I'm going to get the praying. God's going to move today because I have a special message for you guys today. We're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about this table talk from a Christian perspective this morning. So thank you guys for joining me. I appreciate you. Let's go on in here. All right. Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this service. I pray this morning, Lord God, for those who are serving people in COVID wards. I I pray for my brother Ben this morning, Lord God, that you will begin to keep him, that you will protect him in the name of Jesus, that you will keep all the responders, Lord God, all the nurses, all the people that help in these hospitals, that you will protect them this morning, that you will protect them, Lord God, while they are dealing with it, protect their emotions, protect their bodies, Lord God, from hurt, harm, and danger, Lord God, because we know, Lord God, that they are putting themselves at risk. So I pray for them this morning. I pray for those, Lord God, who are in relationships, those, Lord God, who are not in relationships, those who may be struggling with this weekend, with Valentine's Day on the horizon. I pray for them because you said in your word, those who are brokenhearted, you said in your word, Lord God, that he healeth the broken in heart and he mends their wounds. So I ask right now that you will mend the broken hearts, that you will begin, Lord God, to mend those who are depressed because they don't have a significant other this day. Let them see, Lord God, and feel the love that you have for them. Let them have, Lord God, love for the brethren, Lord God. Let them have love for the friendship. Let them have love for self this morning in the name of Jesus. So I come against the spirit of low self-esteem. I come against the spirit of depression in the name of Jesus. And I loose a spirit of wholeness. I loose a spirit of joy. Because the Bible says that in thy presence there is fullness of joy. That the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I pray in the name of Jesus that you will have joy in this season. That you will experience joy. The move of God in this season and that God will bless you with your heart's desire, whether that is a spouse, whether that is a significant other, that God will begin to open up doors and opportunity for you to be blessed in that area of your life. I proclaim it over you, those who need healing, those who need relationships restored. I decree over you right now in the name of Jesus that God is going to restore that God is going to bring restoration to your relationship, that God is going to bring restoration to your marriage in the name of Jesus. Because the Bible says, what God hath brought together, let not man put asunder in the name of Jesus. So I I, I decree over you right now that you're going to be healed in your emotions, that you're going to be healed from the brokenness, that you're going to be healed in the name of Jesus from the whispers, from the things, the lies that you believe, those lies will not come to fruition because God is telling me to tell you right now that no lie is truth and that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the truth is God is for your marriage. The truth is that God wants you to stay together. It is not God's will and God is not going to tell you to divorce or fall against your spouse. That is the enemy. That is your flesh. But the Bible says, by love, we serve one another. So if you need to get counseling, if you need to get anything that you need, you need to go and seek it out. Whether it be counseling, whether it be a a coach, get that. Because that's what we need today. Because there's a lot of things that we can do in church. There's a lot of things that we can have. We can get prayer all day long. But sometimes you need prayer and therapy. Sometimes you need coaching as well as prayer. 
or a good service or a good conference. Because there's a lot of things that are deep rooted that need to be uprooted. And the only way that you want to do that is by getting that therapy, by getting that coaching. Because the Bible says this, study to show thyself approved. You got to prove yourself in marriage a lot of times. You got to be approved in marriage. You got to be approved in love. You got to be approved in husbandship, in a relationship. So I'm going to tell you this day, do what you need to do. Study, learn. It's not going to all come out of church. It's going to come by you picking up a book, picking up an audio book, learning. Because success has patterns. I'm going to tell you that right now. Success has patterns. And the one thing I'm going to tell you is this. So does failure. It has a pattern. And if you want to be successful, you're going to have to learn what is the pattern for success in the arena that I'm believing God for. Whether it be finance, whether it be relationships, you have to understand what it means. What is it going to take for you to be successful? So I'm going to tell you this today. Do what you need to do. But I want you to be successful. Be successful. Be successful on purpose. Because the Bible does say this. That I will show you my faith by my works. And that's what it means to be successful. That you're going to get at it every day. You're going to do it every day. And that you're going to reap the success because you put in the time and the work. The stuff is not just going to drop in your lap. I'm going to tell you, it's not just going to drop in your lap. The world is not going to give you anything. Some things you're going to have to fight for and work for. And that's the God knows truth. So do what you need to do. Let's go in here. We're going to get into the word. I'm praying to God I won't be long with this. But it just seemed like it might be. So I want to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we're going to be reading from verse 1 to 13 if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so that I so to remove mountains but have not love I am nothing if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body, let me hold up. Sounds like I can read better without these glasses. If I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I am gaining nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or, or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So, I ain't gonna lie, man. We always hear that scripture around this time of year. We always hear that scripture when, when we're at weddings. And the one thing that I want you guys to understand and know is that when we talk about love, a lot of times we have to realize that there are many definitions, Greek definitions or Greek words to that word love. And everybody's definition of love is different. I'm going to tell you that right now. Everybody's definition is different. But the one thing that I will say is this, is that we have to realize in order to love and be loved, we got to understand what love is. And that's the God knows truth. So I'm going to give you these statistics just for Valentine's Day. What is love? Valentine's Day sales to statistics. These are the numbers. The average amount spent on Valentine's Day in 2021 was $164.76 per person. I'm going to say that again. 
the average spent on Valentine's Day last year was $164.76. More than half of the spending, or $11.7 billion, went to gifts for spouses and partners. The average amount spent on Valentine's Day is $200. And thirty one dollars. That's that's the amount that most men spend on Valentine's Day. I'm gonna say it again. The average amount men spend on Valentine's Day is two hundred and thirty one dollars. Women spend on average one hundred and one on Valentine's Day. So there's the numbers right there. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of update. According to the survey, shoppers expect to spend on average one hundred and seventy five dollars and forty one cents. Per person on Valentine's Day gifts up from $164.76 in 2021. So there it is right there. The the amount has went up. It was $164.76. Now it has gone up to $175.41. So I'm going to give you the Greek definition. So we have, when we talk about love, here are... Greek words for love, eros, that's the first one, and that means sexual passion, that is a Greek term for love, phileia, or deep friendship, that is also a Greek word for love, ludus, or playful love, that is also a Greek word, agape, now we always hear this when we are in church, we always hear about agape love, and that is a love for the brethren, a love for everyone. Prag, pragma or long standing love and uh, phileatia, uh, phileo, or they say phileo or phileatia, love of the self. And that's the one thing that we definitely need today. We got to have that love for self. I'm going to spell it out for you F I L A U T I A. And that is love of the self. So let's go here. John 21 and 15. And verse 17, I'm going to start here. When we, have, when we have finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said unto him, he said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And so the one thing that I want you guys to understand and know that lambs and sheep are definitely different and they require different types of handling. And so in the cases of love, are we willing as men of God? Are we willing as fathers? Are we willing as as coaches to take and understand that the people that God has given us, they are sheep, they are lambs. And are we willing to show them and teach them better things? Because in this whole area of love, the one thing that I have seen that the church has notoriously done is that we have, you know, broken love down to, you know, do they come to church? Do they, you know, have a good job? Do they have good credit? And this is the, these are the people, you know, these are the requirements. This is the standard. And if you have these things that you can come into a love relationship and be married and and be successful and go and live happily ever after. But the one thing that I want you guys to understand and know is that it is more to a relationship than just good credit, a job, and do they go to church? Because you can't base your whole relationship just on going to church alone. You can't base your whole relationship just on good credit alone. You can't base your whole relationship whether they have a job and money alone. Because when you marry a person, when you're in relationship with a person, not only are you in relationship with that person, but you are in relationship with that family. And you don't know what type of family that you're going to be dealing with. You don't know what type of of structures or mores that may be in that family household because families are different. 
And a lot of times we groom our, our children because, you know, we groom them in a way that is, you know, super independent because we don't know what we're going to be sending our daughters and our sons to other people's houses. We don't know what's in them houses. I could have a daughter right now and I could raise her, but I don't know the type of man that she's going to pick or even the family that he comes from. But these are the reasons why we have to begin to have hard conversations. We got to begin to meet each other to see what type of, of family, you know, he comes from or she comes from. See what type of values that they have. See the type of morals that they have. See what they stand for. Because a whole lot of things can be avoided if we as people would just be honest and talk to one another. I think a lot of times we as people, we make assumptions. We assume that certain people have certain things because of this or because of that. Or we assume that they were raised in a particular way. But a lot of times it's not the case. And so today we are going to talk about the table, the infamous table. The table is nothing but a metaphor. It is a metaphor for a relationship to see if we are compatible enough to even be in a relationship. But I'm going to come with it from a Christian perspective. And so I appreciate, man, just this weekend, we've been talking about this thing. We've been going all over Clubhouse with it. And I appreciate the different rooms that I've been invited into, the different rooms where I was able to speak. I've been I've been in Christian rooms. I've been in rooms in Africa. I appreciate my Ghana connection. First Lady, Trish, Seth, all you guys. I appreciate all of you guys. Ben, all of you guys. MJ, all of you guys. Seriously. So I just, you know, I'm thankful because when we get into these rooms, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes the dialogue is very profound. It can be challenging at times, but at the end of the day, Iron sharp is iron. And a lot of times you got to see other people's perspective to say, okay, this is what we have and this is what we're dealing with. So I want you guys to be aware that everybody ain't raised like you. That's the one thing I'm going to tell you from the door. Everybody is not raised the way that you were raised. And so you have to take that into consideration. When you are talking about dating, when you are talking about love, when you're even talking about marriage, because sometimes the way that people were raised is going to come into your relationship and it's definitely going to come into your marriage. That's the God knows truth. So let's go on in here to understand how to love. We have to see what love is. And I'm going to take you down to first John chapter four, verses seven to 12. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. I'm going to say that again. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So, I'm going to go ahead and say that, you know, you can't sit up here and say that you love God and hate your brother. You can't sit up here and say, you know, I, I love God, And I'm this for God and God is my friend and be racist because, you know, you can't love God and, and, and be racist towards your brother and sister because the Bible says, how can a man love God who he hath not seen and, and, and not love his brother who he sees every day. So you can't sit up here and say, say you love God and you hate your brother. I'm going to just be real with that. So let's go here. God loved us so much that he gave his son and gave us one another. So the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We get that. But he also gave us one another because he said it is not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a help me. So God has given us, you know, men. He has given us women, but he's also given us children. He's also given us one another. So we can't sit up here and say that we don't need each other. We do. 
And so that's what I love about God is that he gives us gifts. He gives us gifts that will benefit us, that will complement us, but also gifts that will begin to bring forth other gifts. Gifts of sustainability, gifts and blessings that will that will go generation to generation. And so you have to begin to look at life as life is prophetic, but life is also seasonal. And the one thing I'm going to tell you about life is that life is seasonal because you go through the stages of life. You go through different seasons. It's prophetic because you begin to decree and pronounce certain things because prophecy is the testimony of what was, what is, and what is to come. That's what prophecy is. And so as as a man, as a woman, you know, you guys are prophetic when you come together. And that's the one thing that I want you to realize and know this morning is that fathers, you are prophetic. God has called you to be a prophet, priest, priest. And the king over your home. And that's a different message for another day. We'll do that on men's day. (laughs) On Father's Day. So let's go here. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. And I'm coming out of the Holman Christian standard. Then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. In the light of Genesis, we have fallen. How is this that God, you know, loves us to give us Another person. How is it that God loves us so much that he gives us a help me to compliment us? But when we look at divorce, divorce is rampant in our lives. Divorce is rampant in the church. Divorce is rampant in our nation. So if God has given us, you know, a woman or if he's given us, you know, a man into our lives, how is it that we're not able to stay together? Because I've heard it all. Ooh, you the one that God said that I'm supposed to marry. And got prophecies and, oh, you're the one I pray for. How is it that all of a sudden, if this is the person that God has ordained for you, how is it that all of a sudden, three, four, five, six, seven years later, that all of a sudden now, oh, God told me to get a divorce from you. So you're trying to tell me that God changed his mind. That's what you're saying. But the one thing I'm going to tell you is this, is that a lot of times people use God for the excuses in their lives. They use God as an excuse. God told me to divorce you. Ooh, God told me to do this. Oh, God told me to do that. And that's just their car blind to get out of jail free card because they don't want to take responsibility. And that's the God knows truth. And I'm going to tell you this. If God told you this, then you have to understand the one thing with God is seed time and harvest. You have to realize what comes with seed time and harvest. Season. That's what comes with seed time and harvest. Seasons will always come with seed time. Seasons will always come with seed time and harvest. Because the one thing that I want you to know is that there's going to be a season where it comes up, a flourishing. And then there's going to be the winter season. And a lot of times people do not know how to handle the winter season In their lives because it's dark and it's cold. And a lot of people, man, they leave good spouses. They divorce good spouses because they're in the winter season of their of their lives. They're in the winter season of their relationships. I'm serious. Some of you have had good spouses. Some of you have had good boyfriends and girlfriends. But because you could not discern the season, you left them thinking that the grass was greener on the other side. And you got tricked uh, thinking that it was springtime, summertime, always over there. And it's not. I'm going to tell you, man, yo, you can love the Bahamas and Jamaica and Bermuda all day long. But they go through a rainy season, too. And that's the God knows truth. Even in Florida. Even in Texas. Man, please, nobody ever thought that it was snow in Texas, but it done snowed in Texas. Nobody ever think, man, it, man it's too nice down here to have a, a storm. Man, please, don't ever think that something is too nice to not have a storm. I'm going to tell you, man, you you deceive yourself when you think that it, the, the, the conditions are so perfect that there are never a storm will never come here. You deceive yourself when you think that it's so perfect here that a storm can never happen. It will. Trust and believe. So you need to prepare. Preparation is not lost 
time. I'm going to say it again. Preparation is not lost time. So let's go back in here. The Pew Research Center found Protestant individuals, anyone who identified themselves as non-Catholic but Christian, included 74% of all Christians and had a divorce rate of approximately 51% of all sampling of a sampling of 4,752 individuals. So out of 4,752 individuals, approximately 51% of them divorced, claiming they are Christian. So the one thing that I want you to realize is that the Bible says that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Just because you saved doesn't mean that you are exempt from the problems of life. Just because you save does not mean that, that you don't have to have work in your relationship. Just because you're saved and go to church Sunday after Sunday with your boo doesn't mean that you ain't going to have problems. You are going to have problems because trust and believe as long as there's seed time and harvest, there will be seasons. And just because you go to church doesn't mean that you're going to be exempt because even church people get divorced. We have seen that just recently. We've seen that with so many, you know, Christian celebrity couples and so many people, you know, call themselves, oh, let's have couple goals. These are our, our idols for our couple goals. So many p- people was putting a demand on, on, you know, Devon Franklin and Megan Good. Yo, the relationship goals. And then they fell off. You know, and the one thing that I want you to realize is that You don't understand or even know what is in some of these people's houses or marriage. That marriage might have been a prop. Some of these marriages are props. And so to to sit up here and say, these are our goals, you don't know what is in there. Your marriage might be stronger than theirs. So the one thing that I want you to realize is this, is that if you are going to have goals, you're going to have to sit down and write them goals out. And that's the God knows truth. And I think a lot of times we as born again people, we get caught up in this whole thing of comparison. If it ain't like Jay-Z and Beyonce, if it ain't like Russell Wilson and Sierra, if it ain't like Devon Franklin and Megan Good. Seriously, if it ain't like Jason Momoa and Lisa and, and uh Lisa Bonet. You gotta get out of this whole thing of comparing yourselves. You know, comparing yourselves to celebrity couples, even comparing yourselves to other married couples because you are unique and God has not called you to be a clone. He ain't called you to be a duplicate. He called you to be you. So these are the statistics, man. Yo, wives are the ones who most often file for divorce at 66% on average. That figure has soared nearly to 75% in some years. So most of the times, wives are the ones that file for divorce. So, you know, I'm going to tell you this. It doesn't matter whether you are Christian or not. This is the one thing that is happening. And a lot of people want to sit up here and blame God or want to blame this person or blame that person. We both have something to do with the demise of our marriage. And that's the God knows truth. It's just that women are fouling faster than men. And that's the God knows truth. So let's continue. The following states have the highest divorce rates in the United States. Number one is Arkansas. Number two is Oklahoma. Number three is Nevada. Number four is New Mexico. Number five is Kentucky. Number six is Wyoming. Number seven is Delaware, my state. Number eight is Utah. Number nine is Kansas. Number 10 is Alabama slash Missouri. The states with the lowest divorce rates. Maine. Number one, number one is Maine. Number two is the uh, District of Columbia, D.C. And it's crazy, D.C., D.C. Number three, South Dakota. Number four, Pennsylvania. Number five, New York. Number six, Illinois. Number seven, Jersey. And the crazy thing about it is that uh, here's all these big cities, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, New Jersey. So when you talk about Illinois, people always want to mention Chicago. How violent Chicago is. How, how, how Baltimore is. 
you know, how, how Pennsylvania is, how New York is, talking about the gun rates. But at the end of the day, I'm like, you know, yeah, they might have high gun rates and this and that, but it's a low divorce rate there. And that's the God knows true. I'm like, I don't get it. I'm serious. Let's go back in here. Number seven, New Jersey. Number eight, Iowa. Number nine, Wisconsin. Number 10, Massachusetts. I'm telling you right now, yo, y'all better get down to Martha's Vineyard. Y'all better get down to the Inkwell if you want to reconnect. Let's talk about black marriage in America. Over the last few decades, marriage has been a declining institution among all Americans, and its decline is even more evident in the black community. In 2019, only 30% of African Americans were married compared to 48% of all Americans. Half, half or 50 of African Americans, 50% of African Americans have never been married compared to 34% of all Americans. After viewing the available data, we can see that although fewer black women are now married, more black women than black men have been married at least once. This is because a higher percentage of black women are divorced and widowed than men. Also in 2019, just under half of 48% of black women had never been married, which is up from 44% in 2008 and 42.7% in 2005. So this is us. This is black marriage in America, and we need to begin to change this whole statistic. I'm going to tell you right now, man. So, going back in here. Is it love? So, as a pastor, I am expected. I am expected as a pastor to have answers or to at least bring in people who can equip you with the tools for your success. And so, the one thing that I realize is this, is that in order to understand what God gives me to give to you, I also have to know that as a shepherd, that there are different types of pastures that God needs to allow allow me access so that you can be fed the right type of nourishment. So the one thing that I want to do concerning you is the one thing as a pastor is this. I'm going to be marrying you. I'm going to be dedicating your children. I'm going to be the one to bury you. And so the one thing that I want you guys to understand is this is that at the end of the day, I want you to be successful. I want you to be successful in your relationships. I want you to have all types of babies. I want to be able to do all types of dedications. And when it comes time for you to go home and be with the Lord, I want to be able to speak at your funeral and understand and know that you are a good person. I want to be able to give to your family the greatest testimony is that you guys stayed together. Is that you guys, you know, you you overcame things. I don't want to sit up here and, and you as a person and bury you. And then there's nothing that you left your family. Your family, you know, is, is burdened with the burden of burying you. Because there was nothing there. So there needs to be things set in place. So that if you close your eyes, that there will not be a burden. We shouldn't have to put up. A go fund me for your funeral. But a lot of times that is what's happening with our people. Is that we got to do a go fund me. Because there was nothing put in place. No type of insurance put in place. So it's up to me as a pastor. To make sure that you have the right tools. So that in later in life. You don't become a burden to your family. When it comes time. If you happen to get sick. And have to go into a nursing home. Or you you know, got long-term care or something like that, or you just died, you know, suddenly. You have to make sure that things are put in place. Because I want you, even if you aren't here, I want I want to make sure that your family is covered. And that's just me as a pastor. So when it comes to, you know, getting you educated on certain things, if I don't know it, I'm going to bring somebody that does. When it comes to finance, I'm going to give you the spiritual aspect of it, but I'm also going to give you the natural aspect of it. When it comes to relationships, I'm going to give you the spiritual part of it, but I'm also going to give you the natural part of it because in order for us to have successful marriages, we got to be successful in our dating. We got to be successful in our communication. And a lot of us, we don't know how to truly communicate. 
We don't know that there is awareness that comes with communication. We don't know how to listen. We don't know how to be expressive. And so, you know, we got to begin to look at family upbringing. So if we're going to have a singles ministry, we're going to have a singles ministry. That's not just going to be focused on you sitting in the pews, but we're going to have a a singles ministry that's going to be focused on you developing skills that's going to be able to propel you and be successful, successful in dating, but also be successful in marriage. So there's a whole lot of things that you need to do in in preparation for marriage if you want to be married. But if you don't want to be married, you still going to need preparation. You're going to need preparation for finance. You're going to need preparation for taking trips. You're going to need preparation for your retirement. That's what you're going to need. And so, like I told you, preparation is not lost time. And as a pastor, I need to prepare you for when you leave. Even if you leave my fellowship, because the Bible does say that one man planteth, another man watereth, but God is the one that gets the increase. So I have to prepare for the day that you leave my house, that you leave my my sheepfold. Because trust and believe, you may stay, but others may leave, or you may leave. And I got to be okay with that. But as a pastor, as long as you under under this roof, as long as you under this ministry and this covering. I'm going to cover you and I'm going to make sure that you have what you need for success. And I'm not going to be the type of person, you know, I ain't going to give you no clues. I ain't going to give you no, no wisdom because you ain't here. Nah, man. If God gave it to me freely, I'm going to give it to you freely. Freely you receive, freely give. The only cost will be is you listening and the time that you take to listen. And that's me. So, I want to give you Malachi 2, verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And that is why I'm saying what I'm saying, because my lips need to keep knowledge. And so the people are going to be looking for answers from me. And I need to be able to point them in the right direction, where if God has given it to me, I'm going to give it to you. So, my goal as a pastor is to tell you the truth. Number one, The relationship table talk is a necessary discussion to test compatibility. I'm going to say it again. Number one, the relationship table talk is a necessary discussion to test compatibility. Number two, compatibility is only met when there are plans, measurements, and goals set that each person is happy with. Number three, once compatibility is established, then the work of building can begin. Number four, each person brings with them tools that are necessary to create the table that they wish to build, sit, and be served at. Number five, the table must be sturdy to hold whatever items you place upon it. Number six, the table mustn't be lopsided or have three legs. The table must be able to hold weight and be level. Number seven, The table must be large enough to accommodate both of us sitting across from each other, but not too large where we are out of reach from one another. Number eight, the table must be future proof to potentially add others who will eventually join you. And that means children. So you got to begin to future proof that table because others are going to join you at that table. So, so when we begin to have the table talks, We got to know the following. Number one, do they genuinely like you? Because if they don't genuinely like you, they can't build with you and they definitely can't love you. Number two, no one person is the table. I hear this a lot. When you start talking at table talk, well, what do you bring to the table? I am the table. So you the whole relationship. Seriously. So you can tell when a person says that, that they don't know what that means or they're just telling you, giving you a warning sign that the relationship is going to be about them and them alone. And I'm going to tell you this, in this world, in relationships, you need reciprocity. So number three, no one person should bring all the tools to the work site where you're going to be building the table. 
So I'm gonna tell you this: no one person should be. I'm bringing this to the relationship. I'm bringing this. I'm bringing that because we gotta build it. No, one person should not be bringing all the tools. If we're gonna do this together, then both of us are gonna bring tools. You need to communicate and see what type of tools you're bringing to the work site. The work site is where you're gonna set it up at. And then you need to make sure that you are building with a person that you like. Seriously. Because if this is gonna be a relationship, we gotta make sure that the work site is good. We gotta make sure that we both are bringing tools. And we gotta make sure that we genuinely like each other if we are going to be building together. And a lot of times people don't are honest with each other to say, I don't have all the tools. Or I haven't brought any tools. Or matter of fact, I don't even like you. I just like that you got power tools. I like, you know, what you're going to put on this table. That's the reason why I'm with you. Nobody's going to be honest and say that. But in the same token, you got to be honest enough or be discerning enough to realize where they're coming from. And that's why we need to have awareness. And that is why we need to listen. So let's go back in here. Four. Sex isn't the whole table. Neither should it be the goal of building the table. I'm going to say that again. Sex isn't the whole table. Neither should it be the goal of building the table. Five. Money isn't the whole table. Neither should it be the goal of building the table. That's the one thing that I want you guys to understand and know is that sex shouldn't be the goal of the table. Money shouldn't be the goal of the table. I'm serious because money can be temporary. So can sex. That's the God knows truth. And if you build in the table just because of that, you need to check your motivation. And a lot of times people are motivated by sex. They're motivated by money. And you have to realize who you're dealing with and what type of people they are. Not saying that they bad people, but they might not be the people for you. And that's the God knows truth. When we sit at a table to dine, there are the following. So here's the one thing. When you sit at the table to dine, there are the following things that are presented to you at the table. Number one is the appetizer. Number two is the full course meal. Number three are the desserts. And number four, if you stay around long enough, you might have coffee or tea. And that's the God knows truth. And these are the things that they offer you. So we are the ones, first point, we are the ones who serve, sit, and eat together. Point number two, no person should do all the sitting, eating, or serving. I'm going to say that again because it goes with number one. I said in number one, we are the ones who serve, sit, and eat together. Number two, no one person should do all the sitting, eating, or serving. You can't say, number three, final point, you can't say I want the benefits of what you serve, but I don't want you to sit or eat with me. So you can't sit up here and say, I want the benefits of you, but I I don't want you sitting next to me and I don't want you eating with me, but I want what you serve. Because number one, you got to realize that if we are in relationship together, we are both putting out effort. You just can't benefit all from me and I not benefit from you. Because I'm going to tell you, man, life is a two-way highway at times. Life is a two-way street. Grace goes both ways. So you can't sit up here and, and, and say, you know, I want the benefits of you. I want you to serve me, but I don't want you to sit with me. And I definitely don't want you eating with me. That don't work like that. It don't work like that if you are trying to build a relationship. Seriously. And if, if you are in a relationship with a person like that, you made a bad choice. I'm going to tell you that. I'm being honest. Let's continue. And the one thing you have to realize is this. When we are talking about is it love, you got to realize this ain't takeout. This is dine in only. And a lot of times we expect to have gourmet food at fast food prices and speed. But the one thing I'm going to tell you about fast food is this. Is that a lot of times when they put that food in a bag, some of you know this, that when you done got in that car or got away from that place or done got home, they done forgot your fries or they done forgot this or you got cold fries. And the crazy thing about it is that you don't have that type of mess up when you are dealing with a gourmet restaurant that serves you good food 
at, at high prices that sit down on me. Seriously. You ain't going to complain about that. But in the same token, you ain't going to tell them, you know, hey, I want the two for five. I want extra cheese with my lobster. You ain't going to tell them that. And you're going to treat it differently. There are some restaurants where there is a month-long waiting list. That's how good it is. And then you, when you get there, you know, you done did everything you needed to do. And you expect for the food to be good. And it, most of the time it is. But when it comes to relationships, you can't sit up here and expect gourmet food at fast food prices at fast food speed. Because I'm going to tell you this, if you get that type of speed, if you get that type of food, it will not bring you nourishment. It may give you, it may sustain you for the time being, but in the long run, it'll make you sick. And that's the God knows truth. And anything worth having will be the type of thing that you won't put time into. Anything worth having is worth putting the time into. And that's what I'm saying by giving you these metaphors. Seriously, that's what I'm saying by giving you this type of symbolism. You can't have a good relationship without putting in the work and time to make it good, solid, and without paying the price for it. All relationships come with a cost. The cost of a relationship is time and the resources that come with you. The biggest detriment to us as people is we believe the lie that we do not need each other. We as humans, we can function to a degree independently depending upon the task. And that's the one thing that I really want to hammer home is that we believe the lie. We believe the lie that we don't need each other. We believe the lie that we can be independent from each other. But we are dependent on each other. We are interdependent upon each other. But when it comes to the relationship, ooh, girl, I don't need no man. When it comes to relationships, men, we we say the same thing. I don't need no woman. What, What can she do for me? You know, Janet Jackson's son, what have you done for me lately? You know, what's love got to do with it? So at the end of the day, the one thing that I want you guys to understand is that we have believed a lie. We believe it through social media. We believe it through these magazines. We believe the lie because uh, feminism has come into the come into the church. We believe the lie that we can have traditional, you know, relationships, traditional marriage, but still keep toxic independence in that relationship. No, you can't. And that's the one thing that I want to tell you, and that's the, definitely the one thing that I want to uh, warn you about, is that you can't have toxic independence and want traditional marriage and traditional relationships. It ain't going to work. And that's the God knows truth. We as humans can function to a degree independently depending upon the task. However, we as humans are dependent upon each other for survival Men and women are dependent upon each other to commu- uh, to continue humanity. God has always said, be fruitful and multiply. In order for us to continue the human race, we have to have each other. You need my seed for your egg to produce another human. So we need each other. It's like puzzle pieces. We need each other. We go together. But to hear some of the uh, the... The verbiage that is out here today, to hear some of the rhetoric and the narratives that are out here today, you don't need a man. You want his assets, you want his resources, but you don't need him. All that is, is I want to benefit from you, but I don't want you sitting down with me and I don't want you eating with me, but I want what you got. It's not going to work. And a lot of times they don't, you know, they don't want to hear this because they looking at it from a person who is a celebrity who says one thing but does something totally opposite when she ain't on or he ain't on a live or even on a video. And that's the God knows truth. Because the one thing I'm going to tell you is that Hollywood will sell you an image. Hollywood will always give you an image. That's why the romance industry is so big and large around this time of year. 
Yo, man, look, my sister told me the other day that six roses in a vase to be delivered was $90. She wanted to get that for my niece. And so you got to understand that you want to pay the cost this time of year. The price of chicken went up. So, yo, you definitely going to pay for that if you're watching the game. Seriously. But we can't sit up here and say, I want your assets, but I don't want you. And that has always been, you know, with our culture. You want the benefits of our culture, but you don't want us. You want the benefits of, of being black. You want the benefits and in the, in the, in, in the prestige. You want our culture, but you don't want us. You don't want the burden that comes with us. You like everything about our culture, our music, our this, our that, but you don't want us. And I get the fact that you don't want us, but when it comes to our relationship, and that's dealing with other communities, but when it comes to us in relationships, dealing with one another, we can't be like that. That is what has broken up homes. That is what keeps our sons and daughters in a repetitive cycle of broken marriages and relationships because we feel as though that a man or a woman is, is like a bus. They come every 15 minutes. And I'm going to tell you, yeah, you up here getting a ride off of this one, getting a ride off of that one, you ain't going to never get nowhere. Seriously. Because after a while, you got to pay the cost to get on the bus. What happens when you run out? What happens when you run out of funds? What happens when you run out of resources? Nobody ever thinks about that. So I'm telling you today, we got to stop believing that lie. We need each other. Black man, we need the black woman. Black woman, we need the black man. You need the black man. I, I'm going to say it again. Black woman, you need the black man. Black man, you need the black woman. We got to stop blaming each other. I'm telling you, man, look. Black men, you control the relationship dynamic. You control whether or not you choose to marry her, be in a relationship with her or not. Black women, you control the sex the sex aspect of the relationship. You got the car, the car keys, the gas, the tires, and the GPS. We, you, it ain't like we just, you know, Jedi mind tricking you into sex. Nah. You having sex with us because you want to have sex with us. And that's the God knows truth. And then on top of that, you control whether or not you have our babies. So we got to get out of this whole blame game. Because at some point, we both have disappointed each other. But we need each other. We, it, I'm telling you, we need to heal. And we need each other. And that's the God knows truth. So whether it be by therapy, whether it be by coaching, whether it be by whatever means you need to take, heal. Because I ain't going to lie, man. It's not fair that you taking, you bleeding on somebody else. Seriously. It ain't fair that somebody has to pay double the price and only get half of you. It ain't fair that somebody is forced to walk on eggshells because of what the last person did. And that's what has happened to us. It's not fair because you dated dated 10 losers. Now you want to try to say that the whole collective or the whole community is like the 10 losers you dated. And then you want to say it's their fault. But you, you're the common denominator. How is it out of a barrel, you got a barrel of 50 apples, but 10 of them apples are bad. How is it that you keep picking all the bad ones? How is it that you picked out all the bad ones? How is it that you got all the bad ones? Seriously, you need to ask yourself that. How is it out of all of these barrels of apples, I, I managed to get all the bad ones? Seriously. The common denominator is you. And for some odd reason, you just pick bad apples. Whether you didn't examine it fully or because it was just an easy grab, you picked it anyway. But then you want to holler about, ooh, it tastes bad. But you picked it. Seriously, you picked it. And so I want you to understand and know is that you, we got to have accountability and responsibility among ourselves when it comes to our life choices. Seriously, I had to wake up and realize it was certain things in my personal life that I had to deal with. 
I had to deal with I had a Superman complex. I had to deal with the fact that I had a Jesus complex, feeling like I can save everybody. Because the one thing I'm going to tell you, when you have those type of complexes, feeling like you can save people, feeling like you can fix people, then that's when your your awareness will be for those who are, are in distress. And a lot of times, certain problems are not even real problems. And after a while, you just get in the, oh, man, I, well, I can save them, I can fix them. And then some of you have ran into people trying to fix and you done playing Superman and they your kryptonite. But you also have to realize that Superman was Clark Kent. And you killing Clark Kent trying to play Superman. Some of you are trying to play Jesus thinking that you can heal a person with your external means to heal their internal issues. It ain't going to happen. You can't sex internal trauma out of a person. I'll tell you, man, you need more in a relationship than just love. And even though the Bible says that we should bear one another's burdens, it's some burdens that you just can't bear. And it's some burdens that some people won't have to take to the Lord. And in some people, you can't be their deliverer. Jesus has to be their deliverer. Telling you that right now. Because I don't want you to think that you can't help. They have to want it more than you. You can't want it more for them than they want it for themselves. So I'm going to tell you this. Women, you can love your man, but after a while, he's going to have to take responsibility of getting his own healing, his own deliverance and restoration. Vice versa, same thing for, for the man. You can take and love that woman all day long, but you can't heal her, her traumatic issues from her childhood. She's going to have to go to God for that. And she's going to have to be responsible enough to, to, be, to make sure she gets that healing. There are some people that has to be responsible for their emotional needs and issues. They have to be responsible for their emotional well-being. They have to be accountable to get the help that they need. And so you can't be the end all be all. You can't be the one, you know, trying to fix it. Like it says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And that's the God knows truth. So let's go down here. We believe the lie of independence. We believe the lie that men are not necessary and women are not necessarily. We believe the lie that it's all men's fault. We believe the lie that it's all women's fault. We believe the lie that men are no good. We believe the lie that women are no good. And all they want is one thing. We believe the lie that we can have successful homes without each other. That we can have successful homes and we can have successful children without each other. But I'm going to tell you this, sisters. As bad as you may be, as rich as you may be, as accomplished as you may be, you cannot show your son how to be a man. He needs a man that's in front of him. He needs to see somebody just like him. And that's the God knows truth. I'm going to tell you this, men. You can try to do it on your own, but your daughter eventually is going to have to see another woman. She's going to have to see another woman so that she won't be caught in the masculinity trap. And that's the God knows truth. Same thing with boys. We got to be able to put them boys in front of another man so they won't be trapped in being infeminate. Seriously. We got to make sure that they don't get caught in the femininity trap and they aren't infeminate or that we don't emasculate them. Seriously. So that is why we need one another. And that is why these table talks are necessary because number one, we have made assumption all day long. We fall in love with assumption, potential, and the imagination of who that person is supposed to be and what they're supposed to bring to the table. But in reality, we all come with baggage. In reality, we all come with issues. So you need to make up in your mind, what are you willing, what are you willing to deal with? What's going to what's gonna be your deal breaker? But if you can figure that out, you're still going to be building the table together and you're going to be serving one another. You're going to be sitting. You're going to be eating together because the table is always about fellowship. And that's the God knows truth. We fellowship one another. We might be husband and wife, but we fellowshipping together. 
We might be boyfriend and girlfriend, but we fellowshipping together because that's what the relationship is. That's what the table is. A place of fellowship. That's the work site. The fellowship. And then we build the table, which is the relationship. And then we place things on the table so that we can enjoy one another. Let me give you this. And then I'm, and we're going to land this plane. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that is what is coming out with these lies. And I'm telling you right now, I never thought that I would see what I see today because the dating pool is jacked up. I'm serious. When you compare marriages and relationships back in the civil rights days versus today, we have more stuff today, but we're not even staying together as families. They didn't even have what we had back then, but they stayed together. There was a mother. There was a father. There were children. There were even grandparents at times living under the same roof. But what the one thing that I want you to realize is this, is that we got to come back and say, okay, if we are going to have traditional relationships, if we're going to have traditional values, we need to kick this toxic independence out of our lives. I'm serious. We need to kick misogyny out. We need to kick misandry out. Seriously. We need to kick all of that stuff out. I'm telling you, man, don't, don't, don't buy into the lie of feminism. I'm telling you that right now. Don't buy into that lie, especially if you want a traditional relationship. Because I'm going to tell you, man, like I told another brother the other day, where do you think the black woman got the information on government assistance from? Where do you think she got it from? She got it from a feminist who was hit to the game on what the government did. And, 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 and you got into that system that kicked the man out the house. And now who's your man? The government. And now we realize and think that now we don't need nobody. And these are the same women that are now talking about you, the black woman, who's having all these babies and kids on welfare. But you was the one that told her about the welfare. And then on top of that is white women on welfare. White women getting child support. So don't sit up here and just say it's just all blacks getting EBT. I better go ahead with that. I'm telling you right now. Nah. Y'all believe the lie. And the crazy thing about it, when it comes to our community, the black community, we're the only community that has that. The white community ain't got that. The Latino community ain't got that. I'm serious. I, I'm, I don't hardly hear no Spanish women saying we don't need these men. I'm serious. I don't hardly hear no Asian women saying we don't need these men. I don't hardly hear no white women saying we don't need these men. But I hear our black women say that about us. And then you have the audacity to say that we don't feel protected. But then in the same token, you say you don't need us. So how is it you can say that you don't need us, but then on, on the other hand say you don't feel protected by us? But you want independence. You want to be able to turn your femininity on like a light switch. Off and on like a light switch telling you, you can't sit up here and have, you want traditional marriage, you want the benefits of a traditional man, but still want to keep toxic independence. It ain't going to work, sister. I'm going to tell you that right now. It ain't. Seriously. And I'm going to tell you, men, wise up. Wise up and do what you were called to do and be who God has called you to be. And some of you men, yo, don't you be a sucker. I'm telling you, don't be a sucker because there are many women who are who are opportunists out here looking for a dude that they can sucker. It's many, it's many guys out here looking for church girls who they can sucker. Seriously. Looking for any type of girl that they can sucker. So beware of the opportunist. Because they about themselves and they will suck you dry. Take all your resources and, and give you the speech. Oh, it's not you, it's me. And there you are. You couldn't have said that after I done 
co-sign for you after I done spent all types of money on you. And now all of a sudden you have the audacity to say, it's not me. It's you. You could have very well told me that when I first met you. Could have told me that a month into uh, knowing that you like me. You could have told me that right before you put me in the friend zone. But now you done said, oh, it's not, it's not you, it's me. I'm going to put you in the friend zone, but thank you for all your resources. Seriously. And that's what happens to a lot of guys and gals. People use them, exploit them, and then they use up all their resources and then they friend zone them and then keep them just in case. And then they done got used up, <laughs> body all stretched out, then after they done been blown out, stressed out, now they want to take you out to friend zone and be in a relationship with you. Really? You better watch that. I'm telling you right now, watch it. Research indicates, I'm going to say this and then we're going to close. Research indicates that on average, children who grow up in families with both their biological uh, parents in low conflict marriages are better off in a number of ways than children who grow up in single step or cohabitating parent household. This is relationship goals. That's relationship goals. To raise children in a house with both parents with low drama, with no drama, with low turmoil. That's the goal. That should be relationship goals. So, to have success, we must be interdependent and dependent on one another. So, when you need or see or hear from your partner constantly, I'm going to give you the definition to interdependence versus codependency. I'm going to give you the difference. When you need to, to see or hear from your partner constantly, you are in a dependent relationship. And I'm going to just say this. There are times where we are dependent, where we need to communicate one to another. I can't sit up here and work 14 hours and not call my wife. I can't sit up here and work, you know, 16 hours and not, you know, call or text and say, hey, babe, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be this. I'm doing a double. You got to make sure that you communicate. Communication is the basis of life. Exchange is the process of life. Seriously. So you can't sit up here and try to say, nah, you know, I shouldn't have to call you. You know I'm working. Nah. What if something happened? just can't leave each other in limbo, especially if they're used to hearing your voice. Can't sit up here and just change a pattern like that. No, you got to, you got to, you know, gradually turn that corner. You just can't all of a sudden make a sharp turn and then, you know, expect stuff not to be all bounced all over. It, life don't work like that. And if you drive in something, it don't work like that. Trust you're going to uh, upset something. If you were driving a truck and you made a sharp turn unexpectedly instead of going into a gradual turn, what's in the back with the cargo is going to be upset. And if it shifts to a certain degree, it could flip your truck. So the one thing that I want you to see and know and understand is this, is that some things you're going to have to do gradual because people learn by patterns. Seriously, people learn by patterns. Let's go back in here. In, a, in an interdependent relationship, you enjoy seeing the other person minus the neediness. So that's the one thing. You enjoy seeing that person. You're giving that person emotional support. And then there's not a cleanness. There's not a neediness. And the reason why there's not a neediness, there's not a clinginess, is because you made the gradual changes to let them know, like, yo, you can trust. If you don't hardly hear from me, I'm doing what I need to do for us. And a lot of times we have put our spouses through extremes and then we wonder why stuff falls apart because we need balance. You need balance in your love life. It just can't be about extremes. That's the God knows truth. When we have the mindset of serving one another, we will never feel as if we are losing ourselves and independence by serving. We will develop an interdependent mindset that will bring balance. So I'm going to give you this and then we're done. Galatians 5, 13. We're going to land a plane with this. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love 
serve one another. So that's the reason for our love is to serve one another. That's the reason for relationships to serve one another. And a lot of times we feel as though that, you know, I'm in a relationship. He needs to serve me. I'm in a relationship. She needs to serve me. But the Bible says by love, serve one another. So that means this service goes both ways. Jesus said, he that is the greatest among you, let him him be the servant of all. So if you are great in your home, you're serving your home. You're serving everybody in your home. And, and, And you don't have to just have one great person in your home. There can be two great people in your home. And after a while, if you get the kids, you know, groomed and and groomed and, and, and taught, you can have X amount of great people in your home because we are serving one another. By love, serve one another. He that is servant of all is the greatest of all. And if you want great love, you're going to have to have great service. And that's the God knows truth. That's the one thing that I want you to realize know and understand that if you're going to have a great love, you're going to have to have great service. And what I mean when it comes to this whole table talk, it's about serving, sitting and eating together. And so when you hear people say, oh, I am the table, I bring it all to the table. It's just about them. They don't have the concept of we serve one another. Even when it comes down to this whole argument about submission, it's about submit one to another, submitting one to another, serving one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples indeed when you have love for one another. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? It also says if two lie down, they have heat. And that's the one thing that we got to realize, man. We have grown cold. The love of many has grown cold. But we need together so that we can lie down and have heat. So, I just wanted to give you this because this was Valentine's Day. But I want you to start making smart decisions. If it means I have to come on here and start giving you some encouragement and start schooling you about these relationships and stuff like that, I'm going to do it. And I am committed to doing it because I want to see you succeed. Because I am tired of us losing out. I'm tired of seeing us in divorce. I'm tired of us getting our heart broken and can't even get our time back. Seriously. So, this is my message for today. You have to understand and know whether or not it's love. But when you come to that table, when you are compatible enough and you want to build, then you need to understand and know, no, I'm not going to be triggered by this conversation. Because... When you take sex out of the equation, when you take decoration out of the equation, when you take, you know, just being able to uh, cook for a person out of the equation, you have to ask yourself, what do you bring to my life? Because, you know, let's forget about the food. I know you can cook. Forget about the sex. You're very attractive. Get about even decorating or making the house a home. What can you bring to my life? These are the questions that need to be asked. What can you bring to my life? What can you add to me emotionally? What can you add to me if I tell you my dreams and my visions? What can you add to me if I'm being vulnerable with you? What can you add to me if I'm being authentic with you? What can you add to me if I genuinely like you? What can you add to me if I genuinely love you? And these are the answers that you need to hear. These these are the questions that you need to ask, and they need to give you some answers. If they can't answer that, then you need to ask yourself, what am I here for? I'd rather have you walk away from a relationship than to stay in a bad relationship too long. And I'm going to leave you with this. You can't turn a red flag green. I'm telling you, them red flags are red flags for a reason. So, I want you guys to be blessed. I thank you for this time. I appreciate you guys. I know it was a little long, but I needed to say all of this.
because you need to get all of this. That's the God knows truth. Seriously, you need all of this. You need to hear this word of truth because so many people are like, Lord, is it even possible? It is possible. Yeah, you can have love and be loved. And that's what God wants for you. So be blessed. Enjoy the game. I'm believing God that Odell Beckham is going to be MVP. Yeah, I said it. Seriously. But I love you guys. When you have truth and life, you have freedom. Follow Truth and Life Urban Ministry on iTunes, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Like, share, and subscribe to Truth and Life Urban Ministry. All right, my Instagram family, my Ghana family, I'll see y'all on Clubhouse. Peace.